Walker, Lena says. The sorters have made a new list of, for you. Another one, Okra asks. Put it over there. He gestures to one end of the long table. In theory, Okra needs the lists from the sorters because their input is valuable. Sorters try to discover which factors are most likely to contribute to the immunity. Okra has figured out what that means in the real world. If eating some kind of plant seems to be a factor, what component of the plant is the most important? How do you put that into a cure? In a concentration, in a collaboration, to support the save everyone time to increase the chance that we'll find an effective cure quickly? The Okra never seems to include a, to drop what he's doing and read through the list right away. I know how hard Casilla has been working on shifting through the information. It's valuable, I clear my throat to say something, but Lena speaks first. You need to look at it, Lena says. The sorters have been through all the data again and the least information from the infirmary and from your own observations. They've modeled the likelihood of each of the ingredients could affect the treatment of the disease, right, Okra says. You've said this all before, he states from his office holding his data pod. Oker, Lena says. As the cure administrator, I need to insist that you look at the list, or I'll remove you from your duties. Ha, Oker says. They're not another fully trained pharmac in this place. Your assistant is perfectly competent, Lena says. Oker mutters something and then comes over. He picks up the data pod. They're always sending lists, he says. What's so urgent about this one? We have another sorter now. Lena says reminds him, and you can be sure that those back in the Providence are using sorters to help decide on the next cure. Of course, that's what they're doing. Okra says they use this to be society. They're not capable of any originality of thought. They can't act without numbers. Lena tries again. A new sorter, Kasia. Okra waves his hand. I don't need to know about the sorters. I'll go look at it now. He walks back to his office, taking the data pod on the list and shuts the door behind him. After only a few moments, I hear the door of Ogre's office open. I expect him to say something chaotic about it being time for Lena to leave, but instead he stands there as if frozen, his eyes narrowing in thought. Casmia, he says. It's Casia, I begin, thinking that he's trying to remember the name of the source. For some reason, but he cussed me off. No, he says, Caspia. It's a plant. We haven't done much with that one yet. Now he's muttering as if he doesn't remember that we can hear him. It's edible, nutritious, even if it tastes like potatoes. It's only sweeter. The flower is purple. It's where the Cadmus province gets its name. His eyes snap back into focus, and he looks right at me. I'll go dig some. Kasmia is not ranked very high on the source list, Lena says. This isn't the society Okra Girls. We don't have to go by the numbers. We have room for intuition and intelligence in the village, don't we? We can find the cure faster than the people in the Providence. But only if we stop thinking the way they would. Lena shakes her head. I know she doesn't must be trying to decide the best way to deal with this. And she asks herself the same question she has asked before. If Ochre is valuable enough, asks it, that she can let him do what he wants, even when it's in direct opposition of what she thinks is best. How about this, Ochre says. You gather the other ingredients and I'll make cures you want too. He looks at Noah and Tess. You stay and keep the bags going. We have extra, Noah points out. We're going to need a lot more, Ochre says impatiently. Do not let any of the patients run out, especially the newest one. He turns to me, come on, you can help me dig. We only have seven patients available for trial now, Lena says. As Oker points to the thing he wants to put in the bag and clears bulb straps, canteens, and two small shovels. The other patients still need time to get the most recent cure trial out of their system. Then we'll only use seven patients, Oker says, barely able to control his frustration. The pilot will need more evidence. Then a few cured patients, Lena begins. Then we'll give them all my cure, Okra says. He pushes open the door. We're taking, talking in circles. I'll make the cure. You decide who gets them. He makes sure someone takes mine and then I'll get the most recent still to try my cure. 
and then he glances over his shoulder at Lena. You should ask the sorters to calculate the odds that we're going to figure out this pus before the people back at Providence do. We're not the pilot's best hope. He's throwing everything he can into the air on the chance that something might take flight. And we're the smallest, weakest bird. Your medication made a difference, Lena said firmly. The pilot knows that. I didn't say we couldn't be still be the ones to figure it out, Hooker says, but only if you let me do what I need to do. We have Capsicea in our stores, Lena says. One final protest. You don't need to walk all the way to the Capsicea fields. I want a fresh one from the ground, Hooker says. Then I'll send someone out to the Glen and field, Lena says. That will be faster than you going yourself. No, Oka says. No. He takes a deep breath. I don't want anything to compromise the cure. I'll see it through from start to finish. Now it sounds some, like something a real pilot would say. I follow Ochre out the doors. I don't trick myself that Ochre picked me to come with him because he trusts me the most. He can count on Noah and Tess to prepare the medicated nutrient bags for the patients, but he can't trust me to manage that yet without supervision. He just needs someone to dig for him, he, and he likes to talk to me about the mutation because I'm the most recent person to work firsthand with the still. I've seen the mutation up close. Of course, this would all be integral to him. He's the one who came up with the first cure. He knew about the plague before almost anyone else. How far are we going? I asked. A few miles, he says. The field. I want isn't near here. It's close to the other stone village towards Cadmus. I follow him and he, it all looks like grass and rock to me. Nothing stands out in the pathway. People must not go to the other village is often anymore, I say to Ochre. Not after the latest gathering at, to Endstone, Ochre says. We've sent people out to harvest different wild crops since then, but it doesn't take long for the mountains to reclaim the path. Every now and then we pass around the stone pressed flat on the ground. Ochre says the stones indicate where we are all on the right track. I walk all the way out here, Ochre says. His voice sounds peaceful and competitive, but he moves fast as he can. Back then the pilots often flew you as far as the first stone village, and then it was up to you where you went after that. I decided on Endstone since it was the farthest away, though I might not make it since according to society I was old enough to be dead, but I kept going. He laughs. I walked through the day on my own final banquet. That's what my friend tried to do, I said to Ochre. He tried to keep walking through the mutation. He was convinced that he would keep moving. He wanted to go still. Where did he get an idea like that, Ochre asked. I think it's because Cassia walked through the blue tablet once. She took one and kept on going. I expect him to say that was impossible, but instead he says, Maybe your friend's right. Stranger things have happened, he smiles. Cassia's an unusual name. It's botanical. The bark is used as a spice. It's, is it any relation to the plant that we're going looking for now? I ask the name sounds so similar. No, Ochre says. Not to my knowledge. She helped with the list, I say. You should look at it again after we're done with his Mia. I don't bring up the fact yet that she, not Ochre, should be the one who decides which cure Kai gets. Ochre stops to get his bearings. I can go faster than this, but he's in excellent shape for someone who's old. Because Mia should be near here, he says. And this is where the villagers come to harvest. But I don't won't have taken it all, and he will always have to leave some to grow for next year, If the, even if you hope you won't be here. He leaves the path and starts down through the stands of tree. I follow him, the trees and the mountainsides and pines and some others I don't know. They have white bark and thin green leaves. I like the sound and walk under them. Ogre points down, see it? It takes me a moment, but I do. The flowers are a little dead and dry, but they're purple like he said. You can dig here, he says. Do not take them all. Dig up every other plant. We don't need the flowers, just the roots. Wrap the roots in the burlap and wet them in the stream. He points to the tiny revolt of the river winding through the grass. Turn it marshy. Be fast as you can about it. 
and kneel down and start digging around the plant. When I pull off the bulb, it's brown and dry and tangled of roots coming out. It reminds me of Casilla and how the two of us planted those flowers the day we kissed in the burrow. That kiss has kept me going for months. At the stream, I wet the strips of burlap and wrap the burlap one after another. I keep digging, the sun shines down on me and decide I like the smell of dirt. My back aches a little, so I stand up to stretch it out. I'm almost out of space in the bag. Ochre, impatient for me to finish, crushes down next to me and starts swaying the plant with a motion clamsy. The flower bulbs back and forth, back and forth. He pulls up the roots, fumbling with the twisted hands, and he gives the plants to me. Can't wrap it, he says. You have to do it for me. I wrap up Ogre's harvest and finish filling our bags. I was starting to sling his bag o over my shoulder with mine. I should carry it for him now that it's full. Ogre shakes his head. I can carry my own. I nod and hand it over. Do you think the Kismia is really the cure? I think there's a very good chance, Ogre says. Let's go. He has to stop and rest on the way back to the village. Forget to eat this morning, he says. It's the first time I've seen him worn out. He leans up against the rock and his face twisted into a scowl of impatience as he waits for the heat to stop racing. I've been wondering something, I say. Ogre grunts and he doesn't tell me I can't ask, so I go ahead. How did the villagers know that they were immune to the plague in the first place before the mutation? They've known about their immunity to the original plague for years, Ogre says. The society first sent it to the enemy, one of the pilots who dropped the virus ran away from his army base and came to the first stone village near the one nearest Cadmus. Hooker takes a moment to catch his breath. What the idiot didn't realize when he came, Hooker says, is that he himself had caught the plague. He thought he could only come through the water because of how he disturbed it, it distributed it in the enemy's rivers and streams, but it also be transmitted from person to person, and he had contact with some of the enemy. Apparently he tried to help them before he'd come to the stone village. Why did he run to the village, I asked. He was one of the pilots who took the first, took part in the vanishing, Uger says. So he knew the people in the village and they knew him. A week after he took refuge there, he became sick. Uger pushes himself away from the rock. Let's get going. Birds chatter and trees around us, and the grass grows so long over our path that it whisks and whisks against our pant legs. Of course, the society had the cures for any of the workers who happened to contact the, contract the disease, Okra says. But since the pilot didn't go back to society, he didn't get the cure. He came to the stone villages, he died. Because the villagers didn't have the cure, I say, or because they killed him. Okra looks at me and I glan he glances the sharp. They left him out in the woods with food and water, but they knew he died. They had to, I say. They thought he could infect the whole village, Ochre nods. When the pilot came sick, he told them about the plague and the enemy and what happened. He begged the villagers to go back to society to get him the cure. By the time he had already exposed most of the village, the entire community thought he was going. they were going to die. And they knew they'd never get their hands on the cure in time. They had to try what they could. Ochre laughs. Of course, at the time, they had no idea that they would turn out to be immune. Did they exile anyone else? No, Ochre says. They quarantined those who did, who'd been exposed, but no one ever got sick. I breathe out a sigh of relief. Their immunity wouldn't have mattered to the society, of course, Ochre says, since they'd already had a cure, but it meant something to the villagers. They knew that if the society tried to put the plague in the village's water, they won't die. For the most part, they kept their immunity a secret. Someone told the pilot, but he didn't do anything with the knowledge until the mutation happened. And then he wondered if the villagers might be immune to the mutation too. I say, right, Ochre says. He came out here to ask if anyone was willing to test the immunity, to find out if we could help discover the cure. I know people volunteered to be exposed to a mutated virus, I say. Why? Foil where me meals, Ochre says, sounding disgusted. He brought us an entire cargo hold full of them and said that he could bring more. Why would anyone want those? I asked. The food here is so much better. For the trip to the other lands, he says. Those meals last for years. They'd be perf 
Rick for the journey. The pilot promised that he could get enough for all the travelers to take. If only a few of us would volunteer to expose to the virus. They injected people with the mutation and had them go oh, stay in one of the other villages just in case. No one got sick. Now Walker grinned ear to ear. You should have seen the look on the pilot's face. He couldn't believe there was a chance. That's when he offered us the ship if we could find a cure. Oker steps over a puddle and blue flowers growing right in the center of the path. Your friends who have tried to walk through the illness are closer to the truth of the virus than the blue tablets than you might think. Those tablets aren't poison. They're a trigger. A trigger? I ask. When Sonny made the plague to use on the enemy, Oker says, they engineered several other viruses at experiments. One of them had a very similar effect to what the plague does. It made people stop and go still, but it couldn't be transmitted person to person. It only affected the person who had direct contact with the tablet. The society decided not to use this particular virus on the enemy. They used it on their own people instead. Oker glanced over his shoulder back at me. Society named the viruses. He says, when that one was called the Karelian virus. Why? It's another word for blue, Oker says. And they used blue labels for the virus in the lab so they could easily tell it apart from the others. I wonder sometimes if that's what they gave the officials the idea to use in the blue tablet. The society modified the Karelian virus so that it put in the baby's immunization. Then if they needed to, they could trigger the virus later with the blue tablets. That's perfect society logic, I say. When, while they're protecting you, they also implant the virus so they can still control you if they need to. But why didn't more people go still before now? Because it's latent, Ogre says. It works in the way into the DNA, and then it lies dormant. The virus doesn't become active until it you take the trigger, which is the blue tablet. If you take one, you go still and s until society helps you. If they find you in time, then you don't die. If they had a cure for the Karelian virus, as well as the plague, but that was a limited for the science. They hadn't found a cure for the mutation. Why are you telling me all of this? I ask. Because I could drop dead at any minute, Oker says. Someone needs to know what's going on. And that's why you picked me? I ask. You don't even know me. You know people who have the mutation, Okra says. You've got family and friends on the inside. And that friend of yours here now. You want people to get better for the personal reason. And you know that if you don't get your friends cured, you'll always wonder who she would have chosen out of the two of you. Okra's right, of course. He knows more than I thought he would have, although I shouldn't be surprised. A true pilot would have to be that way. We don't talk the rest of the way back. When we get to the lab, we sling the bulbs onto the table and wash them. Ogre tells Tess and Noah, but don't scrub them. We want the clean from the dirt. They nod. I'll sort the best bulbs, he says to me. Pushing through the assortment with his knuckles, you gather equipment. We need knives, cutting boards, mortar, and pestle. Make sure they're all sterilized. I hurry to get the equipment ready. Ogre already finished sorting by the time I'm done. He taps a little pile of bulbs. These are the best ones, he says. We'll start with them. He pushes towards me. Cut it open. You're going to have to do this part. I can't. So I make the incision down the middle of the bulb. When we've laid it open, I draw my breath. It's layered like an onion inside. The color is beautiful, pearly, almost glittery white. Ogre hands me a motor and pestle. Pulverize it, he says. And we're going to need enough for everyone. The door to Ogre's lab slams open. There you are, Lena says, her face pale. Sent someone out to the village to find you. We just got back, I say. Must have missed them. What is it, Ogre says. It's the still, Lena says. They've started to die. The room goes completely silent. It's one of the patients from the first group the pilot brought in, Ogre says. Yes, Lena says, her exile in relief. It means it isn't Kai. This has happen to happen eventually, Ogre says. The first group has been holding out for weeks now. Let's go see what we can do. 
Linda nods bef before we go. Booker has me wrap the bulbs back in the lock them away. Get back to the bags. He tells no one Tess. But I don't want anyone working on the actual cure unless I'm here. They nod. Ogre takes the key back from me, then only to follow Lena towards the infirmary. When people have gathered outside the crowd parts for Ogre and Lena to come through, I follow behind them acting like I belong here. And I'm lucky as usual because no one stops me or asks what I'm doing. They did. I tell them the truth and say I found the real pilot. I'm not letting him out of my sight until we get the cure.